On the Saturday just gone, it was the Sebring 12 hour, half a day of spine crunching laps around an airfield in the middle of Florida. A race that's not just one of the most prestigious endurance races in North America, but also the world. It was also the first circuit to host the United States Grand Prix, the 1959 race being the only Formula One World Championship race at the circuit, and also the place where we not only saw the invisible qualifying lap, a video I've done on already, but also a midget racer get utterly rinsed by Brabham and McLaren as he thought his car was superior to what they were running. But it's known mainly as an endurance course. It's bumpy, it's got tarmac and concrete slabs as a surface. It's almost like it's a circuit trapped in a time bubble, it's made up of a portion of an old World War II United States Army Air Force base, and is considered to be a car killer and tougher on cars than even Le Mans is. These days though Sebring hosts two events, at least they did last year, they're not doing it this year for some unknown reason, they're going to Kota instead, but we'll get to that in a second. One is the 12 hours of Sebring in Imza, and the other is the 1000 miles of Sebring in the WEC. They're both endurance races, they're both at the same track, and these days, they use the same cars. Sort of. But one thing I noticed during the race in the YouTube chat is the amount of people saying, where's Toyota? Where's Ferrari? Are these hypercars? Is this the WEC? And so on and so on and so on. So with that, I thought I would do a piece on IMSA, the WEC, the differences between the two to help you understand it a bit better, and also at the same time, how they're able to cross over in the way they do, because it's all part of how endurance racing has entered this new golden age. So we'll start with IMSA, because that's the race that was happening at the weekend, America's Endurance Championship. The series, which is owned by NASCAR, has in more recent years formed a closer relationship with the ACO, the organising body behind the Le Mans 24 Hours, which in turn forms the main event, for want of a better phrase, in the World Endurance Championship. While still a domestic level championship, IMSA attracts a lot of international drivers, some of whom have been on the world stage. Nick Tandy, Charlie Eastwood, Philip Eng, Augusto Farfus, Brendan Hartley, Jesse Crowe, Matty Campbell, Matty Brabham, Alex Sims, Roman Grosjean, Harry Tinknell, Seprio, and the Iron Dames, to name quite literally a sample. IMSA races are all North American tracks. In 2024, there will be 10 in the United States and one in Canada. The 2024 calendar is Daytona, Sebring, Long Beach, Laguna Seca, Detroit, Watkins Glen, Mosport Park in Ontario, Road America, Virginia, Indianapolis, and Road Atlanta. Now what's interesting here is that at some of these events, you're not going to see different categories of the cars, if that makes any sense. At some events, you will only see GTP and GTD. At all the races in green, you'll see GTP, GTD, and LMP2. They used to run at Lime Rock, and seeing all three categories there, well, it would be a carnage fest. On the other side, you've got the World Endurance Championship, which is the FIA's premier endurance racing series, and they go to tracks all over the world, hence the name. Now, for simplicity's sake here, for the rest of the video, I'm just going to call it the WEC, because saying WEC is easier, quicker, and calling it WEC just makes you sound like an utter in the WEC for 2024, they visit eight tracks. Qatar, with the very specific 1,812 kilometers, then races at Imola, Spa, the centerpiece 24 hours at Le Mans, Sao Paulo, Austin, Fuji, and Bahrain. Now, there's some absolutely amazing tracks on that calendar. Unlike IMSA, though, this is an FIA-sanctioned series. The tracks used are going to be close to what Formula One runs at, with the exception of Le Mans, obviously. These will be state-of-the-art facilities with more than enough garage space, more than enough paddock space, and plenty of runoff at every track to ensure driver safety. There's all that crossover there, and everything is up to the FIA's own standards. While over at IMSA, being a domestically run series, they don't have to go through the same homologation in regards to tracks. There is one major difference though in terms of the fields. In IMSA you're going to see GTD, GTP and LMP2 at most of the bigger events. In the WEC though, you're only going to see Hypercar and GT3. You're only going to see LMP2 this year at Le Mans. Basically the WEC changed all of this due to the surge in entrance in Hypercar and the fact that GT3 is a cheaper and much more enticing category to enter, while LMP2, let's face it, is the Orica Cup. But what is interesting here is bringing in what I mentioned earlier about the crossover between Hypercar and GTP. Unlike in the previous regulation cycle where DPI and IMSA and LMP1 in the WEC were two totally separate regulations that meant any team wanting to compete in both had to have two separate cars, now they only need one car for both series. 
In 2019, the WEC started talking about DPI potentially being part of the upcoming hypercar regulations, and IMSA and the ACO started having a chat about whether to actually go ahead with it or not. In late 2019, Toyota was open to this crossover going ahead, so long as the rules didn't mess about with their showcasing of hybrid technology, because Toyota wanted to build its own systems to then trickle down into the road cars. Soon after the hypercar regulations were announced, Ford, McLaren and Porsche all said, yeah, we need the two categories to be merged because this is going to be far too expensive otherwise. So in 2020, just before Daytona, IMSA and the ACO announced LMDH, Le Mans Daytona H. It's not actually been confirmed whether it's hybrid or hypercar. So DPI, LMP1, they're gone. They're gone completely and now we've just got this one category. What it then means is anybody competing in IMSA that decides we want to go to Le Mans can go to Le Mans. And it also means that anybody competing in hypercar in the WEC can go the other way and do Daytona if they so wished. It's, it's brilliant. It's a lot cheaper for everybody. So imagine then if a Formula One team wants to go to IndyCar, they have to buy a DW12 and run that to IndyCar's regulations. Similarly, Andretti coming from Indy to Formula One has to build a car to F1 standards. They're both open wheel formula, but they need two totally different cars. With these endurance rules, they simply load the car up, take it to the track they're going to, and then submit to any BOP regulations. There's virtually no change in the cars, and they can just get on with it without having to have two or three brand new cars built to a brand new regulation set. Like I said, they've saved a chunk of money. It also gets a tiny bit confusing due to having so many names thrown around. I've used at least three already for the top category of the two series. LMDH, GTP, and LMH, or Hypercar. It goes a little bit further than that because under LMH regulations, the manufacturer can build its own car from scratch, including the hybrid system if they want one, but it has to be maximum deploy of this, maximum engine power of this, the hybrid can only be on the front axle, and bits and pieces like that. LMDH, on the other hand, is more off the shelf. The suspension and the monocoque have to be built by Dallara, Orica, Ligier, or Multimatic. The hybrid systems have to come from Bosch, and the gearboxes have to come from x -Track. And just as a bit of an extra note from editing Aiden, you've probably heard me already once in this video, it's easy to see where the confusion comes from. So basically, LMH and LMDH are the regulations to which they are built to, either as a full up manufacturer entry, in the case of Toyota or Ferrari, or as a brand run by an external team, such as Penske and Porsche, but then when they go to IMSA, they're called one thing, and then when they go to the WEC, they're called another thing. But they're the same thing. Does this make any sense now? So the Toyota, Ferrari, Peugeot, Glickenhaus, and Vanwall are all built by those manufacturers. But the Acura is built by Orica, the Cadillac by Dallara, the Lamborghini by Ligier, and so on. But they're not cookie-cutter designs either. Each one has its own distinct shape, which is cool. The BMW has that characteristic mouth on the front that you know is a BMW. On top of this, the LMH manufacturers can base their racing cars off a road-going hypercar if they want to. The concepts for the Aston Valkyrie, for instance, or if McLaren decides to enter the Senna or a successor to the P1. But in effect, hypercar and GTP, they're the same. The only difference is subtle rule changes regarding who can enter and what gizmos you can run on your machines and the balance of performance applied. The WEC BOPs them to their hypercar subcategory, while IMSA does it to GTP, and it's the same with the GT3s. WEC has LMGT3, while IMSA has GTD. However, there are a couple of barriers to entry, at least in IMSA. Glickenhaus and Vanwall, two entrants from the 2023 WEC season and selectable cars in the recently released Le Mans Ultimate game, are not eligible for an entry into IMSA, simply because they're not an established OEM in the American market. IMSA has a rule of a minimum of 2,500 cars built over a 12-month period, doesn't matter what model, you just have to build two and a half thousand examples of a Alpine, of a Cadillac, of a BMW. There is only one exception to that rule in IMSA's history, and that is the Panos Delta Wing. GT3, meanwhile, is... well, it's GT3. In IMSA, it's split into two categories, but in the WEC this year, it's just the one. In GTD Pro in IMSA, there is no driver restriction. Use the best drivers you can get your hands on. But in the regular GTD category, there must be at least one silver or bronze FIA-rated driver, and no more than one platinum driver. Also, in the WEC entry list, it's been capped at 37 entrants due to paddock sizes at Imola. 
that number will increase substantially for Le Mans, which is a longer track with more garages. Although I would like to see what the BOP difference is around a lap at Le Mans. Take the two cars, send them out, what's the lap time? I mean, yes, we do have iRacing, which is more IMSA, and you've got Le Mans Ultimate, which is you know the WEC, and the lap times aren't that far off, but the video games and different physics and different this and different that, but it's something I'd like to see anyway. So then, given the two series crossing over to each other, you might be thinking, well, where was Toyota? Where was Ferrari? What about the wingless boy Peugeot? The simple answer is that Stellantis, which owns Peugeot, doesn't have a market in the US for Peugeot. Yes, it owns Chrysler, so maybe it could enter under that in the future. Toyota, meanwhile, simply has no interest. They want to do Daytona or Indianapolis, but they believe that those events would be better served as crossover events on both calendars, similar to how the Indy 500 was USAC and the Formula 1 calendar. Ferrari, meanwhile, could make a move into IMSA in the future, but at the moment they've decided that the WEC is more important to them. Also, I think there's a rule in IMSA that says that every car has to have a rear wing, so on that front, rip Peugeot. But as it stands, only cars from IMSA have gone to Le Mans or the WEC and not the other way around. Yet, Aston Martin is going to be building to hypercar and going to Daytona if it all goes through properly. But given that IMSA and the WEC have this overlap now, I hope that it means that this so-called golden age of endurance racing sees fans going from one to another and vice versa. Teams like the Iron Dames doing both series and there's also everybody's favourite green Porsche Rexy doing both series and this will allow for both series to grow and it seems that on Saturday a lot of people enjoyed the 12 hour race. But imagine if everybody in the WeatherTech Sports Car Championship and the WEC did Daytona. It would be epic to see that many different shapes not seen since the glory days of Group C. If you were going to have everybody cross over in 2025 you'd have Toyota, Lamborghini, Ferrari, Alpine, Cadillac, Porsche, BMW, Peugeot and Aston Martin if indeed they do come in for 2025. This is what we could be looking at. That sounds epic. And actually something that's just cropped up in my head so I'm going to tag this bit on after I've recorded everything else so apologies if there's a bit of an inconsistency in the audio but during Sebring my wife asked me while I was watching it is endurance racing that interesting to you? Now she likes touring cars, she likes F1, she's got into a bit of IndyCar and she's been watching the NASCAR Netflix series with me, but she doesn't get endurance racing, probably because it goes on for so long. Now I don't watch it all in one go, I'll drop in and out, but being a fan of Aston's and also being a fan of Porsche's LMP1 car as well, it's a case of I'm seeing so many shapes, colours, drivers, and because of that we're not stuck with cars that are all the same. There's the Penske Porsche, there's the Jota Porsche, there's Rexy, there's the Iron Dames, there's the Corvettes, there's the Astons. All those brands mean that you can easily follow your favourite ones and then follow them to another series where you won't have to learn much and you can just drop straight in, just like the cars can. It's a rare case of a series and a regulation set getting it right, at least you'd hope so. Simple reason being, if you're a Porsche fan in the WEC, you can then watch them go and do IMSA and it's the same teams and in a large part the same drivers taking part. Likewise, if you're a fan of Cadillac in IMSA, you can watch them at Le Mans or all of the other events in the WEC and support them there too. And you end up learning more about other drivers, you learn more about other teams, you see some tracks that you might not have seen before, and it keeps everything nice and healthy while at the same time reducing the costs for everybody. Everybody is happy and nobody has made it any easier than IMSA and the WEC. So then, a look at IMSA, the WEC, and how the two series can cross over seamlessly to reduce costs and allow fans of FIA series to watch the US series and vice versa. If this has taught you something new, then do like the video so I know I've done a good job. And for more like this, get subscribed with the bell on so you never miss out on anything else I do around here. Massive thanks as ever to the Rad Lads at Patreon for the continued support. And if you want to help support at a more personal level, a link to Patreon is in the description, along with links to things like Discord, my socials, and also my affiliate links with the F1 store and also Mixed garage if you need some car parts and the super thanks and there's also memberships down underneath the description as well in case you want to support at that level too so until next time i've been Ada Mord. have a great day wherever you are and goodbye